Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, percussion on TV, radio, film, and the concert stage, Eric Darkin. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's another exciting episode edition of the rich redmond show where we talk about all things music motivation and success usually i'm joined by my co-host jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers.com but hey he's a soccer dad he's a baseball dad he's a dance dad he's got a lot of things going on today so we sque- squeezed in this interview and this has been a long time coming very special guest today 32 years a staple of the nashville recording industry probably one of the most recorded percussionists in the history of music, really, very, very prolific. Um, this gentleman is recorded with the likes of Taylor Swift, Bon Jovi, Jewel, Marin Morris, Bob Seeger, Carrie Underwood, and live worked with such folks as Vince Gill, Amy Grant, Faith Hill, Take Six. For the last decade, he's been a member of the Jimmy Buffett Band. And uh, this is our friend, Eric Darkin. What's up, buddy? How are you, man? You. Good to see you. It's good to see you, man. Um, so we're, I know you're a Nashvilleian, 32 years. Uh, if you guys are just consuming this with your ears and not your eyes, uh, Eric has this gorgeous room that is just full of all sorts of membrana phones and idiot phones and any kind of phone, wind chimes, gourd, like a lot of stuff, man. Where are you? There's a lot of junk, There's a lot of junk in here. <laughs> That's the home setup, right? This is my home setup. I've got a studio setup, a home setup, and then for Jimmy, I've got a road setup. So I, I'm one of those guys. It's crazy. So as a, per- yeah. so for the listeners, because we do get some non-musician listeners, a percussionist is essentially anyone that can beat, rattle, scrape, shake, hit um, any object. Like for example, a piano is has all three elements of music. It has melody, harmony, and rhythm. But you, it, it could strictly be a percussion instrument. You could play the sides of the thing. You could pluck the strings. And um, so you have made a living um, out of hitting, striking, and shaking things. And isn't it exciting? It's a, it's a it's a massive special calling in life. And how did it all start for you? We'll go do the typical podcast thing. Take us back. Take us back. Uh, it would have been in Vermont. I, w- I was born in Chicago, raised in Vermont. Started playing drums, started getting, I started, a, I think I got my first drum when I was maybe 10, 12, 10. <laughs> Snare drum. Then I got a drum set probably when I was about 12. My grandfather was a uh, musician. He was a musician in Chicago, I had a dance band. He was not a drummer. He was a trumpet player, sax player, kind of played everything. So he was the one that kind of got me involved in music. So I started playing drums and drum set was kind of my thing for a long time. Sure. And then, you know, kind of branched out late high school, early college. I started getting into more like classical and ethnic percussion. So I kind of started in that drum set thing. And then I moved into percussion in late mid high school, college. Yeah. And that's when I began to study percussion and just sort of like, I just was very gravitated to the whole notion of so many different elements and sounds and textures and, you know, probably yeah. ADD kicked in at an early age. And I'm like, oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. I mean, I was thinking about this, you know, there was a time where I was like, man, I want to be a, I want to be a classical timpani player. And so I'd focus on that. And then I was like, no, I want to be a this. And I want to be, so I was all over the map and, and st- studied a lot of different instruments. And so sure. that's sort of my love of it all was, was, I still love playing a little bit of drums. I still love playing timpani. I play mallets. I, and so, and you do too. I mean, you, you, you dabble in it. So it's, yeah. um, that's kind of how it started. Just, um, and the more I got into it, of course, then you start collecting things and listening and learning and studying with different people. And yeah, and that's what we're at. Oh, it's amazing. You know, it's, yeah, that's for me, like same thing. I, you know, started on the drum set and it's a very rare thing for someone to be so equally you know, it's a really hard gig to be so skilled and p- polished and fine tuned in all areas of music because there's so many styles and every, nearly every style of music has drums or percussion in it. So, you know, the the drum set itself, even though it's a hundred years old, is such a life's work. You know, you can spend your whole life working on that stuff. 
And then percussion, don't even get me started. You have the South America and you have Pan Asian, and then you have the European tradition of like, you know, timpani, glockenspiel, vibraphone, sure. marimba, which is a whole lifelong thing. And I, I love it all. I mean, I studied it all myself, but the focus I knew was going to be drum set. Um, so somewhere along the way, you were like, this is more exciting. I like, I like this area because there's more, st- that's a broader sonic palette. Yeah. Well, and, and I think what happened is op- more opportunities started to come up to play percussion, you know, and it's like, no, you know, and it, I just sort of gravitated. It was almost like almost somewhat, somewhat of a divine change. I was like, oh, I'm going to get out of the drum set thing and I'm going to get more into percussion and more opportunities started to come up with that. I was like, oh, okay. So, yeah. um, I, you know, and you'll know what I mean by this is I feel like a jack of all master of none. You know, there's always something to learn, you know, sure. I mean, I spend, you know, I can't tell you how many times, and I know you do, uh, on YouTube or Instagram learning. For, I, I spend hours a week listening to other players, and, and there's so much to learn. You yeah. Know? And, and oh, sure. Every instrument, and I'm still at that spot, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, I interviewed uh, Taku, you know, Hiranu, and uh, he's always talking about, you know, just the time spent in the trenches studying the different, because I feel like, you know, percussion is such a representation of our global community. It's, it represents the food and the cultures of, of like seven continents. And it's pretty incredible thing. And uh, I, I like how you've taken these different elements and combine them in your, your music, you know, because you are a composer. In addition to being a, a recording musician and a side man, you've also done a lot of Com- composing for TV and film, uh, Dateline NBC, 2020, Fox Sports, the Discovery Channel, NFL, National Geographic, feature films. Um, you've released solo recordings, which I love so much. Uh, one of which was, um, was it a little drummer boy? Uh, a drummer boy's Christmas. Yeah, I think 25 years old. You know, it's crazy. It's holding up. It sounds amazing, but it does have a snapshot in time of the giant gated reverb snare drums and some of the flangey Michael Landau guitars and stuff. Oh, oh gosh, yes. Yes. You had to go there. But But it's it's a fun record. It's, you know. It's great. I hear that. I mean, I can hear that being played nonstop uh, during Christmas. Like, do your your checks increase, you know, around Christmas time? Yeah. I get, I get, I still have people still email me or call or text and they'll say, man, I'm still listening to this record. The people that bought it 20, some people have worn it out. They're like, Hey, do you have any extra copies? And I'm sort of getting down. I've got like one box of CDs left of, of the original. But, it's crazy. Yeah, it's fun to do. And, and that sort of represented my love of a lot of different styles, a lot of different music and, and cultures. Um, did so, you do all the arrangement? How did you come up with those arrangements? Cause they're pretty I slick. I co-arrange with a lot of different, what I would do is get the idea going, get a general outline. And then I would bring in other guys that were just better than had a better contribution or a better idea of where to, where to take it. So yeah. I generally had an idea of how I wanted something to feel and harmonically go. And then it's like, you know, I've got a whole bunch of other friends there that, that could take it to the next level, which they did. I love it. And so when you're composing for TV and film is, uh, what's your weapon of choice? Like a MIDI keyboard or. Keyboard. I'm totally a keyboard player. Yep. Nice. nice. So I write on piano and then I fill in the gaps and I use, you know, various samples. I'm not a guitar player. I wish I was. Yeah, uh, me too. Oh man. Um, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a keyboard based com- writer. That's yeah. sort of how I start. I mean, if you can get around on a, on a keyboard, it really is the basis for all things. And it's, uh, oh, yeah virtual instruments now and all that stuff it is whew, you could like get a studio tan and just 23 hours a day in a studio in front of that midi keyboard oh yeah and some of us do <laughs> so. so when you're saying your grandfather was a was he uh coming from like the glenn miller tommy dorsey kind of gene krupa 40s. and they worked around yeah. chicago wearing the tuxedo thing he did it. He was uh, he was a dance band leader. He, you know, that was not his main gig, but on the weekends that just brought in extra in income. So, yeah. But he even played, you know, he played throughout his life. And then even when he was down, they retired to Florida and he was in little community bands, senior citizen bands. So he was playing up until probably a year or two before he passed. Yeah. He loved, he loved, he loved life. He loved life. He loved music. He was entrepreneur. Well, that's cool because you saw you saw that a life in music was 
could be a thing. Whereas, you know, I was, I'm kind of like the black sheep of the family. I didn't have anyone to model myself after just kind of right. dreaming, you know, watching MTV and going, how do you do that? You know, and then you shake hands, but that was cool that right away at such a young age, you saw this is a possibility. People do this. Oh yeah. Well, my father and my mom and dad had a, they had a, their own, they had their own business in Vermont, but they were a little less, they were almost like, so when are you going to get a real gig? What do you, what do you get a really major in in college? So yeah. they were a little less, I mean, they were totally supportive, but I think in the back of their mind, they're like, okay, this is cool, but what are you going to really do? What do your parents so, do? What were they, their professions? They had a sporting goods store up in Woodstock, Vermont. Oh, and okay. Just a little, yeah. Just a little small town sporting goods store. You know, they sold, skis and you know basketballs and sneakers and and soft goods you so, still have your again, folks another entrepreneurial thing yep do you still have your folks nope both gone oh, everybody's sorry. gone not that i think about it ah oh. how did this happen how did this happen like if you moved to nashville yeah. we're, we're about the same age so if you moved to nashville about 32 years ago i tell people hey 22 turns to 52 really fast oh yeah Oh, yeah. No. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. It's just boom. I got a daughter's 26. Wow. So, yeah. Yep. So you coming from Vermont, there's like a little bit of a Birkenstock uh, inner hippie there. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> like, and I love living in Nashville. I love the South. I, I love it. I mean, you travel all over the world, too, but I, yeah. I love all the locations. I love going back up to the east. You know, they they. They, they get stuff done up there. They do. I, I know when I moved to Nashville, I was like, man, I'm just going to have to figure out a way to slow down here. I, I think I just oh, yeah. need to slow down. And I think oh, for yeah. it did a little bit, I, you know, because I was even like crazier. I was like, no one is yeah. going to embrace me. I'm a nut. I'm like a bee, you know, and so yeah. it slows you down a little bit. I get it. I totally get it. And I have to, you know, there's times where I, I that East, I call it the East Coast thing where it just sort of turns on. Yeah. I just kind of go, let's go. Let's get it done. Come on. Yeah. You know. Enough of this, uh, but I can chill. I like the I love the South. I love the pace. I love hanging out, but I also like to get stuff done too. Oh yeah, for sure. Now you went, did, am I correct in saying uh, that you went to Oral Roberts University? I did. I went out there. I went to Brevard College in North Carolina, two year school at the time. Nice, which was near Asheville, and that's where I kind of cut my teeth. I studied with an amazing mallet player named Mario Gatano. Nice, really great. Mal, he was really a classically trained guy. So that's where I kind of got my classical chops from. Then this opportunity for to go out to Oral Roberts, they were like, you can play as much as you want. We got a TV show out here. So nice. I literally went out there and ended up playing on their TV show five days a week, reading music all the time. I was playing in the local symphony. I was playing in a pop symphony. I was I treated it like a music school. Yeah. I barely was able to pass whatever. I took Spanish and English and humanities. You know, I did show up at class, but it was like, yeah, yeah. You know, I was in every ensemble. I played all the time. And that was a huge part of my education. Yeah. And, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, you know, being on live TV and they'd hand you a chart of music and you got to read it. You know, so that learning how to think fast, read, you know, you, you ran through it twice and you were on live TV. TV. That's awesome training. And, and, and that's, that Great probably instilled training. you like, this is really what I'm going to do. I loved it. Oh, yeah. No. And that learning how to think fast, work fast, none of this, hey, can we just run through it again? No, you got to get it. And, that, and, it, and I hate to, I don't hate to say it, but that really was the, the I thought that was a huge part of my education. Was, sure. Was going, this is how it works. You know, now, let me ask you this you about, um, I was going to ask you about, you know, because Nashville, Nashville is less of a percussion town than I feel like a New York or Los Angeles, because in, right. in the both cities, you've got you've got live theater, you've got Broadway, you've got off Broadway. Uh, sure. Los Angeles has uh, TV and film big time. Um, and so you have all the. Lenny Castro's and Luis Conte's that are probably reading something right now with the queue behind them and all the big Marvel sure. movies. Um, so there's less of that in Nashville. A lot of, a lot of what happens is, um, you know, guys like I, me, I play the drum set track and they're like, Hey, I want to give you some uh, shaker tambourine maracas and you throw it in. Or sometimes you're lucky enough to have it be an overdub session, which is great because then you get paid double scale because it's an overdub, but which I love, which we should talk about. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. but so there's, it's rarefied air that you have filled this slot. 
to where it's like you're playing anything that is uh, involved more than the shaker tambourine maraca hey kid you got a cajon you're doing this stuff which is great um which is ama an amazing chair uh, I work so hard on my legit reading. So, you know, reading out of like method books on the xylophone so I could get to the point where I could play, um, you know, dotty dimples, you know, um, sure. xylophone pieces and then read the yep. Kaikawabi four mallet stuff. Are you faced with some of that here for, for big record dates? Because I have never ri ri read written music in Nashville other than a Nashville number chart. It just doesn't seem okay. like the town for it. Yeah, that's the that's the, the the craziness about this is on a, any given week, you know, month, I'll go from like yesterday was a prime example. I was I showed up and I was doing everything was written out. Great. Every note was written and, and it was great. And you gotta put that hat on. I call and I wear a lot of different hats. So I I can wake up and do the I walk into a session, read timpani music, read mallet music. And then the next day I'm going and playing a country session. Yeah. And there's no music. And they're like, hey, this is what I think, but whatever you want to do. So the the gamut is from, you know, I call it the pucker up syndrome where you walk in and go, oh my gosh, I gotta get, you know, read read what's on the page and then the next day or the next week you're doing something completely different i love that i mean that's I, I, sort of how I, I love that too i i mean i'm i'm jealous i i gotta i gotta let the world know that i can do that stuff it just has never landed in my lap that way in nashville but what are the sessions that that you've got to read timpani and mallets on are they like well, there's, film, there's film going on there's a well i'll tell you what there's a lot of gospel sessions that are uh -huh. here that they do a lot of the recordings that go into churches. And so we record a lot of music that mm. a lot of the churches buy that are tracks for their choirs to sing to. And so there's a lot of the gospel orchestra, big liturgical sort of church work. There's still a good amount of um, uh, film and TV stuff that they're bringing into Nashville. Wow. So you got to read that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a chunk of that going on. Um, I have, you know, I thankfully don't get called um, for a lot of intense, like four mallet stuff. I do I mean, people will, you know, I've done a lot of things. There's some, there's some Disney New York sessions that have come down here, like Broadway, where they'll come down and, and, and you're reading xylophone parts and timpani. And, and, and so, um, so it's happening here for sure. Now, is there a section? Well, say you're in a section with some of the guys from the National Symphony or the Sam Bacos of the world where you guys are like, hey. Ron Sorbo. Yeah, there's a handful of us. And the good news is there's there's two or three guys and gals that are great ma uh, mallet players. You know, like, you get this, you know, they're great at that. And and there may be a great timpani player. So there's, there's a little bit like the L.A. thing where in L.A., you know, there's specialty guys and gals yeah. out there that that's their deal. You it's know. pretty much like, hey, you know, you own eight temps and yeah. you've got all the gauges. And I mean, that's the thing with the timpani is just like it's a harder instrument unless you just have incredibly like perfect, perfect pitch. Right. Just the writing style for timpani has gotten so involved that yep. you've got to have some sort of a cheat or a gauge or something. Am yeah, I, I, have eight, I mean, I own eight timpani, eight or nine temps. I own eight or nine temps. I own all the the chimes and marimbas and all that. I mean, so I, I get that. Yeah. And they do write, I mean, they write, I call it chromatic timpani where you basically just have a scale going, you know, and, and a lot of those cues for TV and film, there's, there's no key signature. They're just writing, you know, so um, makes no sense. And so that's, you know, that's a whole nother thing too. Yeah. Um, it seems to me like timpani would be like uh, such a financial investment. I mean, what are we talking here for a good set of four temps? A set of four temps is yeah, six to eight grand. Oh, my God. And then yeah. you got to insure them or you're probably having them insured through the yeah. union. Or it's all, oh, yeah. It's, this is not a, you know. This ain't no hobby. <laughs> this is not a hobby. No, this is, I mean, this has always been a, I mean, I love it and you love it. But it's 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 a business. This is what I do. I wake up every day and I go. This is uh, this is what I do for a living. You know, and, and take it really seriously. And and um, you know, you mentioned about the timpani and all. And, and one of the things that I've been able to do is, and I do this on a lot of the country dates. And I did it. You know, you mentioned Bob Seeger. I've recorded for Bob. And you know, I he'd like bring all your stuff. Well, I bring all my stuff. We we would put timpani and chimes on some of his music. 
great. You know, he was he was wide open. Oh yeah. I mean, I mean, he loved maracas and rock and roll stuff. But there were times I, I call it sneaking it in. But I go, hey, why don't we? You know, a lot of these guys and gals haven't heard. They they've heard of Timpani, but they, the the uh, the idea that they want to put it on their record. Yeah. You know, um, they were cool about it. I mean, look at Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and some of that stuff. Oh, it's like it's there. Neil Peart. Uh, Neil Peart was probably the one. Peart was the one who got me interested in, you know, I was a huge fan. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, he's got Tim, he's got Chimes, he's got Cretales, you know. Hey, he's doing that. Maybe I can do something like that. I, I was intrigued by all that. Carl Orchestral Palmer. Chimes, will te- well, they'll set you back too. Yep. Yeah. You know, one of the first records I played on that did Chimes was a Lone Star. I worked on a Lone Star record um, with Dan Huff, which would have been, what, 20 years ago. And same thing. He's like, oh, some tambourine. Let's do this. Let's do that. I said, hey, what if we, what if we play that chime line? Why don't we double that with chimes? All of a sudden, it was, you know. Which one? Cool because I just interviewed Keach. Uh, what was it? Was it Amazed or was it like one of the? Oh, oh gosh. I forgot. It was, out of, it was off that record. Yeah. Is that the Lonely Grill rec- record? I, it was the, oh, I mean, that was the wedding song of, of the, like, for a two-year oh, period wow. there, Amazed. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. But same thing, you know, yeah. so when I show up in these sessions, a, a pop session or, a, um, you know, I kind of bring in the whole deal. I mean, I'm like an open palette. I don't just go shaker tambourine or congas. I'm, I, I think I use this phrase. I, I think really wide. You know, I look at what I do as a huge open kitchen and just go, man, here are my options. Love that. Now, have you so, felt have you felt the impact of really good sounding uh, virtual instruments, sample packages and MIDI instruments. Cause like a lot of times I'm like, they're like, Hey, just let's just lock with the track. Cause the tambourine's already there. But I'm like, yeah, but it sounds like completely lifeless, soulless and plastic. If you just give me another five minutes, I can pull up my Grover tambourine that I've took the head off of the butter knife. And it sounds utterly fantastic. And they're like, no, we like the, the we like the program tambourine, you know? So are you, are you feeling that a little bit? Yeah, I think we're all I think we're all victims of that. I really yeah. do. I think there's there's um um I play on a I played on a session yesterday and the composer was from LA, guitar player, and it sounded amazing. There was this cool old like a Dan Electro sort of guitar part. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds great. And Five minutes later, the composer goes, oh, that's just a sample. He's the composer. He's the guitar player, and he's using a sample. And it sounded amazing. He goes, I hope I can get a better sound than what that is. And it sounded great. Unbelievable. What's out there now is just, you know, but like you said, you don't get the feel. I call it the air. You know, there's something about the air of a room. There's something about the human feel of something. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, it's just stagnant. um, Yeah. I mean, here's an example. I played on a Carrie Underwood record a few years ago, Mm -hmm. and the keyboard player, um, Charlie Judge, had programmed some stuff. He had played some timpani stuff, and it sounded really good. And the producer's like, let's see if we can beat it. Now, I brought in really good sound and drums, played the part. But there was something about the sample that just worked in the track. Sure. It just worked. It wasn't anything. I don't think I did anything. It wasn't anything that I did that was wrong. It just, there was something about how that sample. Now, that's not always the case with timpani. I mean, sometimes yeah. you're like, man, this, you, this is not going to fall. It sounds like a DX7. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, orchestra bells that are samples. I don't think so. Yeah. You know, that's, that's not going to fly. Um, but yeah, I think we're all, I think the whole sample um, and I've, I've created sample packs. I've got two or three sample packs out there. I get, you know, but, um, there's nothing like the human el- el- element. No, it's, it's, and people are like, what are you doing, Rich? I, I think I've done three or four sample packages over the year. I just okay. released a new one with Yurt Rock, our friends from Yurt Rock. Um, okay. yours is with, uh, I love that sound. What is it? Yeah. I love that sound. Just, yep. I did one years ago with discrete drums, which I don't think they're even around nope. anymore. Yeah. And that was cool. Cool. That was a cool library. That was sounds from my basement. I had a studio in a basement and I just created these really weird, like I was miking up toilet seats and dropping the toilet. I was awesome. really going, oh, yo, I still use it. I still pull stuff from there. Yeah. 
it was just, I was like, ah, oh, just start beating on crap, you know? Yeah, was, yeah. You name it, I was pulling it out and just beating on it. And, I love it. You know, so, it. So when I bring up um, the name Ralph McDonald, I, I know that you'll have stories about that because it's closely related to, you know, you working sure. with Jimmy Buffett now, but sure. I would always hear him talking about his, he would have a doctor's bag. His doctor's bag would be the most used instruments that he would just run out the door. He'd always have it in his car. So, his favorite tambourine, his favorite maraca, his favorite afuchi, some yeah. claves. And and so I have that. I have like this blue Jan Sport. That's my doctor bag that has my favorite, you know, plastic tambourine, my favorite wood tambourine, all the stuff that gets used the most requested by producers. So that's set to go. But then if they have the budget, there's the whole kit and caboodle. And thank God for Michael Knox and Jason Aldean. I was I've been able to squeeze in on Aldean Records, suspended cymbal rolls, castanets, afuches. Udus, brushes on tape boxes, finger snaps. Right. Like, see, I've been able to squeeze it in, not in an unmusical way, but I was just like, hey, hear me out. And our vibra slap, they're right. willing to say, all right, kid, because most things just need a shaker and a tambourine. Now, when it comes to the shaker and tambourine, I'm sure you have some favorite go tos. Do you find that a lot of producers are like, let's hear everything you got? Or, sure. like, yeah, that happens. And, so and then you end up doing that. the same thing that you pull up the very first time. You go all the way through everything and then I mean, they go. I mean, how many, you, what have you got? How, you got, I don't even want to know how many snare drums. Same thing with your snare drums. You've sure. probably got a half a dozen go-to. Right. That you know. It's going to work. Without that. Yeah. But there's also a track where if you've got an extra five, 10 minutes that you'll call, you'll, I call circling it. You know, you circle the wagon. Let's circle the wagon. You want to circle the wagon? Fine. Yeah. You know. Um, true story. I years ago worked on a record with, uh, and I'm not mean to name drop. I'm just going to say it. Um, uh, we were doing a Reba McIntyre record. Drop them. Right? Okay. <laughs> drop them. Drop them. Reba McIntyre walked in and you and, and talking, you, you're talking about all the stuff, the, the Udus and all the stuff that you're playing. I walk in, I go, let's, um, let's, let, we should do a gong going in. It might've been a big phrase. It might've been like the brew, whatever. It was a big moment. I said, we should, we should put a gong in there. And the producer gets on the talk back. Great guy, well-known, well-respected. He goes, man, I'm not sure if Reba's going to want a gong on her record. I said, okay, you want to hear it? I said, let's just, let's just record it. But the notion of gong. Yes. Kind of, and yet I ended up using this cool little smaller wind gong. And it worked great. It was like a modulation or something or like a, like a, yeah, a modulation, but it was just, you know, it wasn't the, they were thinking, Oh my gosh, this is going to be like this huge epic, you know, this epic thing. And it was just, you know, part of it is schooling some of these people, yep. you know, I mean, you know, there's a, you know, here, here's, a problem, here's a shaker, but all of a sudden, if you want it to be gushy, I'll add this to it, you know, you know, so part of it is our job, in a sense, is to sort of go, hey, and there's a trust factor, too. After a while, you just go, give me five minutes and I think I can help you get through. Because a lot of guys, a lot of producers just go, man, just give me a shaker and tambourine. Yep. You know, but um, but you you've been there. Well, so Aaron, are you doing the majority of like, say, the shaker and tambourine session? Um, are you are you doing that as an overdub? So you're the leader? Oh yeah. Okay, gotcha. I used to track. I used to track a lot. There was a lot of records I did in the '90s, and I'd be Brooks and Dunn, Gary Allen, Reba, Trisha Yearwood in the room. Are, huh? In the, in the room. room. Nice. In the room. Yep. And they were all paying. You know, thankfully, they were all paying us double scale, and they were cool about the bread. And, that. and those. Were, that's when the budgets were. We're rocking. So when you were when you were recording, so sorry, we haven't perfected the Zoom thing. Uh, when they were record, you were record tracking down live with the band. Yeah. You were it was the more of a heyday of the industry, so you were making double scale. But now you can you're still making double scale because you're doing overdubs and it's a requirement. And, yep, you have to you know. So I will. Yeah, they'll send me the tracks to my studio, or I'll go to their studio and and. Yeah, when I go in by, by myself, it's a double scale. Which means your house is twice as big as most recording drummers oh, in Nashville. No, 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 it's not twice. <laughs> it just means you can buy more instruments than you have to insure. I have more. I have more. I have more opportunities to buy more junk. So. Oh yeah, 
That's the beauty uh, of the percussion. The beauty of the percussion. So I cut you off. So sorry. What were you going to say about the? Uh, no, I don't remember. I, no, I, it, you know that's that's the. Uh, I think we're all going through that. The whole budget thing. Everybody's trying to figure out how to yeah. how to make great records on a on a on a shoestring. You know, totally. Campaign taste on a beer budget. <laughs> And you're you're a coffee guy, right? I heard that somewhere. We got that in common. I'm a cocky guy. Coffee, coffee. I think it's a cocky. coffee. Coffee, coffee. Oh God, yes. I'm. Yeah. Everybody on the road knows that. Yeah. Everybody pretty much knows that. That there's there's two or three of us on the road that are that are they're coffee guys, and they just know. Um, I travel with Mac McAnally on the side. You, you know Mac, the songwriter. Yeah, you, know. you guys do like a like a duo for a, do in smaller venues. And I saw some footage, and it's really great. You have like a hybrid drum set. Very oh cool. yeah, suitcase. I go. I mean, I, that's the chance that I get to go back to my drum set roots. I get to do percussion, but I set up this little eclectic little. I get to be a drummer, kind of, sort of, you know. Um, and it's really fun. But Mac, my whole point about coffee is Mac is not a coffee drinker, but he knows it's like every day when we get out on the road, he's like, man, I got to get a, we got to get coffee. You know, he, I don't ask a lot, but he knows, you know, I got to, I got to, I got to have it. Well, he's such too. a, well, oh God. Yeah. I'm sitting here with my coffee's cold, uh, but I've had, I can't even tell you how many gla- uh, cups I've had today. It's, uh, it's, I just like it in my hand. It's just a thing. I love it. And now, how are you serious? Like you get it imported? Like you go around? And I'm not that it? serious. Like I'm not that picky. Like like I'll get, but it's just the, it's the fact that I gotta have it. I like it. I like okay. it hot. I like it on ice. Um, and I I have this kind of running joke that like there's a if I can go mom and pop, I'll go mom and pop because I want to support a local business. Sure. Um, I love that coffee house culture, especially I love coffee house food because they always have like a little interesting play oh. on. Oh, boy on like sure. a sandwich or paninis and things. Um, so I love that. But I tell people like I'm I'm kind of a Starbucks guy in the sense that they they make me feel special. Like it's kind of a club, like even more than the coffee, you feel special when you walk in there and the product is so consistent and they always get my name right. Mitch. Mitch. Get that. Where what? <laughs> The rain drum, the the rain. It's crazy. For this for, for this tour this year, I talked to LP. I know you're a minor guy, and that's got to be cool because they're right here in town. You could just go down and say, "Hey, I want." Um, you know, you know, in recent years, it's uh, you know, loops were loops were a big thing, and they went away for a while, and now they're back so big time that like a lot of these first verses with Aldine, I'm chilling right until the drip the big drums come in on the first chorus. So. I pick up all the different shakers and maracas and I'm using rain sticks as gigantic rain sticks as shakers because it's more visual. And so I called LP and they play a lot. You play all that stuff. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. We send the loop out front, you know, because we don't want that to, I could probably figure out how to reinterpret all that stuff with rolling pads, but we just like the idea of just sending out front with pro tools and then I'll add my shaky Good. stuff during the verse, Good. you know, so I'm not just sitting there. Are you making the loops? You know what they are? And this is another thing, feeling the impact of, of technology. Everyone's got the technology now, even entry level songwriters who buy their first Mac can make great loops. And Good. then a lot of okay. times we keep the songwriters demos loops yep. for the master recording. Yeah. There's no such thing as a demo anymore. Yeah. I mean, everything is coming out. I mean, to me, you know, a demo is somebody who brings a guitar vocal from their bedroom with their kids crying in the other room. <laughs> right. I mean, right. not. But yeah, I, you know, what I like to do is mix and match. I like working with loops, but I also like embellishing them with my stuff. So there's Hell a yeah. mishmash. Of- well, I also saw you in this minor couple minor videos where you were playing like like these detuned panderos, and then you would you you had a couple different things mounted, and you would uh, play a mixture of your hands and some like uh, brushes, plastic things. So cool! They sounded lo-fi right out of the gate. Yeah. Well, these things. See, this is like my new favorite: the broomstick. The broomstick. Thing. Yeah. These are made from a guy out of New York. I wish I can't remember his name. But now, is yeah, that the, are, that's not the Promark version? Because I could have sworn he sold the rights to Promark. Okay, that's something else. No, it's different. It's different. I don't think he did. But the Promark stuff's not bad either. I mean, yeah. I, but this is the broomstick thing is sort of a, you know, 
I mean, you use them. I know you do. Oh yeah, so. I love those. Oh, that's 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 a go to. But I mean, I mean, really, man, looking at this, um, we're looking at like you've been in Nashville thirty two years. This is kind of like uh, popular music in the last you know twenty something years. When you're talking about adding percussion to just going through the your discography, so you're talking like Alan Jackson, Amy Grant. You got Barry Manilow, and then you get into the Christian world, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Switchfoot, killer, killer rock band. Uh, then you're getting into the Michael W. Smith, the Leanne Womax, the Hal Ketchums, Faith Hill, Vince Gill. And you did some recording with Jimmy Buffett. So you were kind of on his radar early on. That's the interesting thing. What's funny, you mentioned Alan Jackson, because I, I, I years ago, I still work with him so, but Keith Stiegel, who produced all of Alan's records or most of them, called me he would call me about every 18 months go, hey i got a track for you to work on it was never like hey come do the whole record it was like it was a very specific thing they'd want me to do he calls me one day goes come i got this track i want you to come play i didn't know what it was until i got there he goes bring a marimba and two congas i said all right showed up and then keith is really specific about what he wants because i want congas here i want a marimba there easy great um and he goes, oh, by the way, this is going to be a duet with Jimmy Buffett. Got it. Great. Well, it's five o'clock somewhere. Nice. So literally, I know, little did I know, years later, I was going to be getting a call from Mac to go, hey, we need you to fill in for, um, for Ralph. God, so, you never know. And I and I'd worked on his License to Chill record, too. So I'd done two or three things with Jimmy before I really was involved in that. Now, was the marimba part written out or was this a thing where you had to feel oh. it? You had to just hear it. Just heard it. Yep. Nice. Well, well that's where your that's yeah, where your soul yeah. edge training pays off. Yeah. And I used to do like on a bunch of like the Brad Paisley records and a lot of the records I did with Frank Rogers early on, like Brad Paisley and Darius records. A lot of vibes on that. You know, I just like take a take a number chart and just play vibes. You know? I love that. Oh man. So that that gets you out of the reading thing. I mean, all they I'm reading the same thing you are, the little num number chart, maybe. Um, do you do you do the little cheating where it's like, okay, so you're used to you're used to seeing written out stuff. So if you have one, four, five in a particular key, um, do you write the letters above it or you just I, Yes, I like to. I'm old school like that. Me too. What really gets crazy is when you're when you have to do gospel sessions and they modulate three times oh no oh yeah yeah that's another world oh yeah every so often i'll do a gospel record which are really fun to do but they'll go yeah we're gonna you know we're gonna do a b flat we're gonna modulate up a half step three times and you're just like oh God. you're just trying to oh my I'm god trying to get through the part not you know oh i write stuff out absolutely oh yeah for sure I, i'm you know i am confident enough to tell you that my, my jazz enough. vibes class was pretty short. Uh, I mean, it's like it was towards the end of my graduation and they're just like, we know what you're going to do, kid. Go out and do it. Then we're going to shuffle yeah. you through, you know. But man, the percussion things worked great for you. I mean, look at what you I mean, to yeah. be able to bring that to the table. I, I we talk about we I don't know if we you and I have talked this, but I'm always a fan of what do you bring to the table? Yeah. What do you bring? What does anybody I mean, you know. And, and not only just bring a bunch of junk, but bring the right stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to get inside the weeds a little bit. That's it's like going, what does this person bring to the table? Whether he's a guitar player, keyboard player, your band, you know, Jason's band. It's like, what does each guy bring to the table? What do you bring to a session? Well, you play killer drums and I can go there and I can do loops and I can do percussion. And I can crack. I can put together a, a percussion and drum track for you top to bottom. Yeah. That's pretty, pretty darn cool. Well, man, and, and just I, well, this must be the this is the mutual admiration society because I just love what you do, man. And I got to witness it. We did uh, seven years ago. We got to do this uh, uh, crossroads with uh, Bob Seeger and yeah. Don Brewer was playing drums. That had to be a fun thing. And I and I got to I went up after we recorded. I went up and watched you guys bird's eye and I got to see your setup and how you're interacting with Don. That what I, I what I took away from that was Don was using a click track based on a flashing light yeah that the would guy behind it, his tech would 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 keep the time and they would he would he would it was like yes he was it was a click track but also if bob kind of moved around then they could move it but yeah it was a blinking light so was it but was the click track based on 
the the organic rhythmic flow of the classic recordings from the 70s yes so like and no bob is very particular about the tempos, tempos in the field. i will tell you the honest truth and, I'll, and i have so much respect for don when we were doing like some of the tv shows and the promotional things we would rehearse and bob likes to rehearse which is great he knows what he wants he likes to chase it down and get it right but every time we would run a song, Don would play the exact same fills that Bob wanted. No, no versions or variations. And I really, and it was a total pro. Nice. You know, not moving around, not like, hey, what about this? It was like, whatever that fill was, if we played it 10 times, it was going to be the same thing. Awesome. Very important. Well, that's, Very that's, impressive. that's important. What is he bringing to the table? Well, well, first of all, I mean, he has a, he has a, uh, a, a lineage of being a rock star, but he's humble enough to go and work as a sideman for another rock star, which is pretty cool. And he's, and he's humble and has enough humility and gratitude to give that other rock star exactly what he wants consistently night after night, which is pretty incredible. I learned a lot. Of, I, I took a lot away from, I took a, I took a bunch from working with those guys because I, I was very impressed because I've worked with a lot of different drummers that they would, move those fills around a little bit. But man, I was like, like every time I'm like, I'll be darn if you're not playing the same. And I, respectfully, it was great. I was like, okay, you're going to, you're going there. I love you're that. Do that. You know? Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the story. Uh, you know, so you're working with Alan and then the Jimmy Buffett thing comes along. There's a duet. You play the congas, you play the marimba. Um, uh, God rest his soul. Ralph is a longtime member of the, Coral Reefer band. He's having some health problems. You get called to sub. And all, yep, I'm literally at a studio. I'm at Starstruck in Nashville. My phone rings. And I had worked with, I had done, don't forget, I had worked. So I've done a couple of projects with Jimmy off and on. Never met Jimmy, but I'd worked with his producers, uh, Mike Utley and Mac McAnally. So Mac would call me and I'd work with Mac maybe once or twice a year on, on like a Chris Ledoux record or I'd work on Max record. We, I can't say we were like close friends, but we'd hang out a, li a, a little bit. And, and so I get this phone call. I didn't even recognize the number. I'm like, oh, I'll just call back. I was in the middle of a session. Call back at the end of the day and it's Mac going, hey, call me. I got, a, I got something you want to talk to you about. And he said, so Ralph's having some health problems. Yeah. And would you be okay to come down to Texas and rehearse for a few days and do the first leg? The way Jimmy does, we'll rehearse for a week. And then we go basically do, we do two weeks at a time, five or six shows. That's kind of the, and, we, and then we take a bunch of time off. So we'll do, you know, basically 10 days on, three weeks off. It's not like this continuing. It's great. And so I said, sure. I literally said, uh, yeah, I'll come down. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to show up for three, four, five days and maybe play a gig. I really thought Ralph was going to come back and join up with the, you know, I thought I was down there just to kind of fill in. And, and I'm like, yep, great. I'll, I'll, you know, they sent me a set list. I spent two, three weeks really going through, you know, they gave me about 30 or 40 songs that I should kind of have my head around. And so I spent a good chunk of time. I wanted to show up and make sure everything was cool. Um, I can't, this is a true story. Um, there's a feature at the time that we, they do a version of Brown Eye Girl, Van Morrison, which has a big percussion solo. Okay. So we get to the rehearsal. I'm, I don't know anybody other than Mac and, and Mike uh, Utley. I show up. I don't know any of the guys in the band. And they go, great, we're set up. We got sounds. We're in this big arena. We're getting ready to rehearse. They go, okay, well, let's run something. First song. Guess, guess what the first song is? Brown Eye Girl. Brown Eye Girl. Nice. Let's see what this guy can do. Right out of the... Nice. Not Margaritaville. Not Come Monday. Not ease into it. It was like, let's do it. Timbales and, and, and Conga Soul. Oh, I was like, hell yeah. You wanted to, I said, you want to, I didn't say this, but I'm thinking, oh, okay. So you want to go, go there. And so we're going there. Rock the song, 16 bar open solo. So I was ready. Yes. You know. I love it. And, and so, I mean, obviously it worked out. Um, is Robert Greenridge still playing steel? No, Robert's still there. He plays steel drums and, and percussion. Oh, yeah. No, the same band's great. So, you know, so we rehearsed. 
and did the first leg. And then they were like, man, Ralph is still not feeling well. And, and basically every month they were like, hey, can you come? Can you come hang? And by the end of the year, his health had declined so much. They're like, you know, we'd love for you to join the band if you can. So I don't remember what it, what it was, what, what he was sick he with. Had, well, what happened is he, the, he had a, a lung cancer. He had a cancer issue that they were going to go after. And then right before they were going in, he had a stroke. So he uh, kind of got really hit with a kind of a double whammy. So he looked like such a healthy guy. You look at that footage of him and Gad yeah, playing all the time. He was all muscly. And, great player, man. Yeah. What a great player, a great musician, great writer, great producer. Yeah. I mean, wow. I, I but when you write the two of us and it's recorded 80 times by different artists, you can't imagine what that check is every year. <laughs> oh, goodness. That and then all the sessions. You know, he played for Paul Simon. I mean, it's a who's who of all the records. That I mean, what a tasty what a tasty guy. So pretty incredible. Um, well, I know because yeah. Robert um, Robert came as a guest artist to UNT when I was there. That was really fun. I, I met him there. But who is the drummer in the Coral Reefer Band? His name is Roger Goof. He's from St. Louis. He lives in Nashville now. He does. And he's been in the band. Yeah. He's been in the band for pushing almost 30 years. And um, that's great because you don't hear about him. Like, I don't see him in the magazines. I don't hear him on podcasts. He's very quiet. He's, wow. a, he's actually a great jazz drummer. It's wow. the funny thing. He's a hardcore, like serious jazzer. He's a huge Pat Metheny fan. He goes, he's big into Chick Corea. He's a big Dave Weckl fan. He's, he's, he's all things like jazz. And yet he turns around and plays. But know, he, he yeah, plays. he's got the ability to go boom, whack, boom, boom. Oh, for, yeah. yeah. But I mean, he can, they, you know, he and the guitar player and bass player, um, Peter Mayer and Jim Mayer, they had a band together. Ah. It was called PM, Peter Mayer Group. And what happened was Elliot Shiner produced Peter Mayer's record. Okay. They're done. And then Jimmy calls Elliot and says, hey, I just fired my band. I want to record a new record, put together a band for me. He said, I got a drummer, bass player, guitar player. I just worked with him. I think you'll like him. They go to Florida. They cut the record. Now, bear in mind, Peter's getting ready to go do a solo thing. Okay, he just finished his record. So all of a sudden, Jimmy's like, I like these guys. Hey, do you guys want to go play some shows? 30 years later, it's that's – so they're, they're – you know, Peter still goes off and does shows, but that's basically the core rhythm section are these three, three guys from St. <laughs> Louis who grew up together and hang out. I love it. I love it. And it sounds like Jimmy would be a, a, an approachable, fun guy to be around to keep the same He's band. Right. That, he yeah. loves music. He doesn't micromanage the music. He's a big picture guy. They, it's a very cool thing. They expect you to do your job, do your homework, show up prepared. You know. Now, what are those fans like, the Parrot Heads? That's got to be crazy. They are Ravenous. Prepared. They're, they love music. They love the band. They're very supportive of the band. You know, they're, they, you know, it's awesome. You know, yeah. I can't think of anything more fun than to go. And I've gotten to know a lot of them, you know, and you, you, there's certain cities I go into and I've gotten to know a few of them and they're great. Yeah. They're big time fun. Have you gotten any uh, fan art or bobbleheads or anything like that from fans? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, here's, you know, the truth of the matter is, and, and this is probably too much, not too much information. I stay pretty, I, I've always considered myself sort of an under the radar guy. I sort of kind of lay low and do my thing and, and I'm okay with that. You know, I, I love playing the show. I take the show seriously. I, I totally love that. But, you know, I sort of on days off and all that, I kind of keep to myself and do my own little thing. Yeah. Know? I'm busy doing, I take Pro Tools on the road. That's the truth of the matter. So I'm, I, I can't tell you how many sessions I've done from a hotel room. Oh, with a, with a, with, you just kind of rattle, shake some stuff in the hotel room. I bring stuff with me. I've got slate microphones. I've got a whole, yeah, I'm, I'm bad. Ah. I set up a Pro Tools thing. Yeah. And then so we're, 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 we're similar age. So you're, you're keeping it all together, man. You look, uh, you know, light, uh, full of life and lean. What are you doing? I'm, I work out. I work out every day. Nice. I kid you not. I, I had, uh, uh, we've got a trainer on the road. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's Jimmy's trainer actually. And we get, you know, once he's done kind of working out Jimmy, you know, those of us that want to take advantage of him, he's a chiropractor out of Florida and 
that's kind of his main gig, but he loves to train too. So that's awesome. So I got into doing that. And I just, I, you, you get this. I, part of what I do now and the older I get, I want to stay in shape and it helps me to stay more articulate. I, I think I, I'm more articulate and play better when I'm eating better and staying in shape. I work out, I try to work out every day at some point. Yep. It's like we practice every day. Why wouldn't we want to take care of it? I mean, after, I mean, after I hang up with you, I'm going for my five miles, man. I, I, I do the you run. run. I run five miles and then I, I walk uphill and do diff- different cross trainings. And I do those high intensity workouts where yeah. it's, yeah. you know, uh, I have little apps on my phone and better. stuff. Do you not feel better? Incredible. Feel yeah. the, the key is the consistency because I've always had a little bug for that my entire life, but sometimes you'll get distracted or there's too much on your plate yeah. or you're burning the candle and then you just, you don't make that a priority. But if you make that a priority, it makes everything else in life much easier. No, I, I, and I don't, I'm not trying to, this is, this, this is what works for me is, yeah. is, is people ask me that and I just go, I just, it's important for me. Like we're in the, in a hotel. It's like, I'll go down for 30 minutes, put some ears in and go 30 minutes on a treadmill. It's great. Get a little sweat going. Oh, it's great. It's just clears my mind. And, and, um, and I, I really do think I play better and more articulate, more aware of what's, uh, what's around me. Yeah, man. So what do you think, uh, is a, um, some advice you would give a, a young, cat that's like about to get his bachelor degree in percussion and he wants to do the thing what do you tell him in today's day and age yeah, he just got his bachelor at that point uh be teachable be open-minded sure be easy to work with uh be flexible and like i said i use this phrase and i've done a couple of podcasts um, it, it is what you bring to the table. Think about what you bring to the table, personality wise, easy to work with. You know, think, I always refer things. I, I, I relate a lot of things to food. Why do you go back to the same restaurants? Why do you go back to Starbucks? Why do you think of the things that, that you go back to, you know, and it's like the same thing goes with what we do. It's like they, people want to work with you because of what you, when Rich shows up at a studio, it's like, He's got drums. He's got perk. He's a good hang. It's a package deal. Yeah. So I would say, be honest with yourself. Be honest with your talent. You know, um, and and be aware of what you bring to the table. Yeah. And I love that. You bring it. Yeah. Are you doing any teaching? If somebody reaches no, out to you, uh, I about three to twice a year, somebody will call me, and I just go, I am not a good educator. I can talk about music and I can talk about how I approach music and how I approach a track, but I, there's so many great educators out there. There's such great, um, uh, you know, I'm just, no, I'm not a good teacher. I can talk music. Well, you're being honest with yourself. I would probably disagree with you because if somebody just said, Hey, I really want to work on, you know, getting some better tones on the uh, congas or I want to, can you show me what you do on the, the cajon you would be yeah, great do that yeah but as far as technique and as far as teaching somebody from the ground up about you know i i, I can just i'm just i well thank you i just don't think i'm that great of a teacher i've done it a little bit and i'm like eh, you know yeah you mentioned Faku, who i've never met who I'm, I'm a huge fan of of him i'm a huge fan of obviously lenny and louise but Taku's another one what does he bring to the t- table a lot what does lenny bring what are all these guys everybody brings something to the table, yeah. you know, and that, that to me is, and the other thing I would tell anybody young is be teachable and also listen to as many, every, I'm a big fan of new music Friday. I'm always listening to new music, even if I don't like it, you know, um, I want to be aware of what's out there. Even if I, you know, if it's not my thing, like rap is not my thing. Well, I still need to be aware of what's out there and what's hip and what's in yeah. what's the end thing. Yeah, for sure. So, and it makes it so easy these days to learn about new music with the algorithms because they're like, if you like this, you might like this. And so, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, sure. we didn't have that at our fingertips back in the day. But, you know, they, and it's, it's crazy what, you, what you've been able to accomplish because, you know, most recording musicians, they might have a five-year career, but you've done that over six times. So we're talking like 32 years. Incredible. Well, and and now, so I, again, I, I say this to myself, I'm teachable. I'm always wanting to learn. Yeah. I mean, I, I wake up and going, you know, if, and I joke about this, if I plug in triangle on Google, 
triangle patterns. I'm going to find somebody somewhere in the United States or throughout the world that's going to just blow my mind on like, triangle. Like Neil Grover? <laughs> like Neil. Neil. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I think if we're teachable and if we always, I always want to learn and grow. You know, sure. I don't, I don't feel like I've arrived. So that's part of my own thing is I want to be a better everything. I want to yeah. be better at what I, every show, I want to play a better show in June that I did than, than I did in May. And that's kind of how I approach it. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that will, that keeps us honest and moving forward and keeps succeeding expectations because, you know, we're in a situation where we're doing the same songs a yep. lot. And yep. so we really have to hold ourselves to the highest standards of like, hey, playing mental games with yourself. Like, not only do I have to, you know, bury this click and drive the band and play the dynamics and play the right stuff at the right time and but be present and also be a showman. Like, I got to check all these boxes every night and I want to do it. I want to do it at the highest level every yep. night. Yeah. That would yeah. Be a, and that's part of what I, you know, I go back to this, the, the eating right working out being you know especially i hate to say this but even getting older it's like i need to if i want to play in the game and stay on my game that's part of yeah you know, i i want to be articulate i want to you know it's easy to get lazy and just like ah you know obviously you've seen it too you've seen bands i've watched bands get up there and they don't care you know they're just dialing it in you know Ugh. i don't want i don't i don't want to be that guy they don't so, want to mail it in i don't and i know you're not that guy so oh, no. that's that's the cool thing. So. Yeah, man. Well, this is so exciting. Do you have uh, looking back at your, you know, your body of work? Do you have uh, any uh, recordings or sessions in particular that you were like, oh my god, that was the holy grail. That's just gonna like survive. Like a favorite recording, or oh, god, that's got to be really hard, right? I like being okay. This is a true story. I, and this is, I like being a part of records from the get go, like artists that have. Like I was a part of Taylor Swift's first record. Nice. And I remember going in there, I was working with Nathan Chapman, her producer, and, and he said, I got this little, this young girl, and you just come down and, you know, play some percussion. Um, and I showed up and she wasn't there, but her dad was there. He's like, hey, what do you think of my daughter? I'm like, oh, she sounds like she's a 16, 17 year old country singer. You know, I mean, she, yeah. sounded, she sounded good. It's fun, charming. Yeah. You know. Four months later, she's on the cover of People magazine. You know, so, <laughs> yeah. You know, she went, you know, it was like she was nobody. And now, you know, and it, so for me, it's fun being a part of records like that. Uh, uh, Maren Morris is another one. I worked with her. Carrie oh, nice. Underwood one. Um, specifically, artistically, I did a, a couple of projects with Jewel, who's super creative. Uh, Art Garfunkel. Oh, Simon nice. Garfunkel. I worked with Art years ago yeah anything that's just I'm, I'm a big song i love great songs yeah so um you know i did a willie nelson record years ago and i've told this story before i remember sitting in the in the room i was actually playing vibes on it so i'm um willie singing a chris christopherson song how about that how about and you're that? playing vibes on it i'm playing vibes and it's and recorded for all time yeah and it's just that whole, you know, you know, it wasn't like, and it was a simple part and the whole thing was chill, but it's like, it's Willie, it's Chris Christopherson. Yeah. Hello. Awesome. Hello. Yeah. So that, that kind of stuff moves me as much or more than, than like having to get to play, you know, a gazillion tracks of percussion. And I love to do that too. You know, I, uh, Carrie Underwood's Jesus Take the Wheel. You know, we, we, we created that loop, all that loop stuff in the front of that. You know, we spent almost a day on that song recreating this loop. Well, it's Udo's and there's a ton of stuff. on. Yeah. It. Now, do you, so that's yeah, selfishly, I'm just trying to get a percussion lesson here. Um, is it every, are you trying to tune congos, congas and bongos to the key of the song where they are sitting in the track? Okay. I, now, what's the best like, way to do that? Like a pitch pipe, or do you have like a tuner? Or well, I, yeah, I do a pitch pipe, or you can do a tuning fork. Okay. Tuning fork, pitch pipe, or you know, the piano. You can go to the piano and listen to the track. I also, I don't like this. Is sort of a, a, I don't like percussion the way I approach things. I don't like percussion to stick out. Like if I do seven tracks of percussion. I want it to all sort of be a part of the track. I don't want there to, this is, 
this is me. This is not other people would, would approach things di differently, but I liked it to be part of the whole landscape. So, yeah. um, well, so it's a survival too, right? If it's sitting in the track, it has less chance of being chopped. You know, I mean, um, so when I, that comes back to tuning, so any drums, anything that I do, if it pops, if there's a weird pull in there, if there's a weird tone that's pulling you, then that's so, yes, I like to tune the drums to the track that may, you know, it, there's exceptions to that. All of a sudden yeah. you're like, that didn't bug me. You know, this may not be in the key, but it didn't bug me or the producer. Nice. Um, but that's, you know, to go back to what I'm saying about how I approach the percussion thing, you know, for years I did, I did a bunch of records for Brad Paisley. And you think, God, Brad Paisley, you know, percussion. Man, we did a ton of percussion that you could feel, but you couldn't really hear it. Oh, we it. would do shakers and brush work and all that, that if you took it out, you'd know it wasn't there. You know, so I would create this landscape of stuff, you know, and Brad was very cool about it. You know, Brad, you know. Yeah, he's a searcher. Cool. He searches. He's, he's. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I know I'm getting a little off uh, of what we were talking about. Oh, I love it. But that, but that is sort of how I approach, you know, and any of the tunings, you know, like, like if I'm doing a big bass drum thing, I want the, you know, there's a fundamental to a concert bass drum. You know, it's like, I don't want that to, and that gets goofy because then you got to deal with the kick drum and the bass. And, you know, you, if that's got a weird tuning, then you, you're going to pull your, yeah. You, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Oh. So, totally, totally, man. Well, this was so exciting, man. It really, really, really great. I, I encourage everybody to check out your loop packages and your solo recordings. And then it's so easy to, uh, to see what your body of work is. I just typed you uh, your name into Wiki. All sorts of stuff came up. And of course, you have your website, Eric Darkin, D A R K E N dot com. And there's all sorts of fun things there. And uh, man, you're keeping the world safe for popular music, man. I, and I just well, applaud you. So are you. I'm so really glad we did this. We've been talking about this for a year and we finally did it. So I'm so happy. I'm so happy. You know, scheduling is just, just like Tetris, a busy person like yourself. But um, I'm going to keep bugging you, man. Well, maybe we can bring this into the real world. Go get a cup of coffee. Let's do it. Now that it's not the zombie apocalypse anymore. <laughs> yeah. no. How was your All two right. years? How was your two years with the pandemic? You know what? It was great. I, it, it, this is, uh, I unfortunately had, I, I had, I herniated my back. Oh, shit. During COVID. Huh. I ended up having surgery. So I, I sort of took that time as downtime. That worked out for me. Wow. You know, we were like lifting so, like a giant concert bass drum or something? Or I, you know what? No, I was actually working out with my daughter. I was, we were up in New York and I was hanging out with her and we went to the gym and huh. I was operator air. I know exactly. It was complete operator air. So you're better now? I'm great. Great. Yeah. Great, but man. That, we'll but that was my, you know. But I practiced and I wrote a little bit and, you know, yeah. we did Zoom stuff. Jimmy did some Zoom stuff and Mac and I did some Zoom stuff. And nice. Okay. Yeah. And I encourage everybody to go see uh, Mac Mac and Allie with you on the drums on the hybrid kit, man. Very, very cool stuff. Thank you so much for joining me, man. I sure appreciate it. We will do it again. Thank you, buddy. I love it. And hey, to all the listeners, thank you guys for listening. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And until next time, <laughs> keep doing the good thing. We appreciate it. And thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.